All right, I'm here with Martin from Loughton Strike Force, and you've got a very nice looking Tet Offensive game here. Yep. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the system involved and how you went about setting this up? Um, well, kind of, it was a year ago I just decided to kind of do a Vietnam game, started to build a few miniatures, and then it kind of just grew from there. Right, uh, and it's so grown quite a lot. It's grown quite a lot. Right. Uh, yeah, so I, I kind of added a small uh, river scene uh, yeah. just in here specifically for Salute. Is that, that's more eye candy than really gameplay? It, it, it is, yes. But why not? Um, and you've got some really impressive buildings and foliage going on. Is this a mixture of traditional and 3D printed? Uh, there's, it's mostly 3D printed. Uh, there are a couple of scratch built buildings, but, but that's it. And then you've got uh, some die cast vehicles. There's die cast and plastic model kits as well. Right, and for the figures, which manufacturers? Have oh, you got? lots of manufacturers. So, kind of, I've used Gringos, Empress, uh, Full Metal Miniatures, uh, and some Assault Group as well. Right, nice. Um, and as, what about all the different uh, designs and the advertisements? Are they of the period printed out? Oh yeah, no, I, I like doing the research for games, so I, I like to get that feel for the actual kind of board okay and the uh, obviously kind of Saigon which is what it's based on yeah so they're all period uh, kind of advertising yeah and a lot of research goes into it this is a bit more together not quite as destroyed and ruined it, it is uh, but the Stalingrad game was very much based on uh, actual pictures yeah uh, so aerial photographs so I went into a lot of research into how it'd look at a kind of certain stage during the battle. So, but this being Tet, okay, and the damage mostly came from the Americans in Tet. Yes, yeah. Actually kind of destroying uh, the buildings and actually driving out the VC. Yeah. I, I, I hadn't gone into that. It was basically a skirmish game. Yeah, um, and when it comes to painting all of this stuff, do you have particular go-to techniques for your buildings and your texturing and stuff? Yeah, the, to, to paint buildings is a completely different uh, kind of mindset from painting figures. So if you look at kind of the figures, you're looking at detail. Yeah. When you're looking at buildings, you're looking for, for, for texture. So there's a lot, lot larger brushes involved, a lot more dry brushing, washes, uh, kind of with buildings than you know, I use with my figure painting. Yeah, for sure. And uh, then as far as the game goes, you're playing kind of your own hybrid little system here? Uh, yeah, it's, it's very much a hybrid system. I wanted the VC to just be able to appear and disappear, uh, but not make it too easy for them to do that and still have that kind of friction in the game. Yeah. But it, it then makes it difficult for the Americans, who are eventually going to win. They yeah. have to win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're going to get to find themselves in some nasty situations. Yeah, because I mean, Tet, the VC, really did take a hammering, didn't they, ultimately? Oh, they, oh yeah, uh, no, they, they, they lost the Tet offensive massively. Yeah, but they won the hearts and minds. <laughs> and, uh... Exactly, it was the kind of start of the end, really. <laughs> yeah, and uh, these little cards that you've got, are these all specific to, the, to each uh, little section, or are these just for everyone they're, to they're, use? They're for anybody to use, so... They bring in kind of extra shooting. They allow figures to deploy, to fall back, uh, to kind of give them extra movement. And you can play them at any time. Right. So the, the Americans might want to fire at you, and then you play a card, which trumps whatever they're doing, to actually kind of move figures out of their line of sight. Uh, so cool. it's, it's very much uh, kind of to add that friction into the game. There's just detail all over the place. I just like that kind of small detail. Yeah, there really is. No, it's a great project, and uh, so this was about a year in the works for you? It was, it works out about four months. Right. Uh, so, I, I, I'm a teacher, so the summer holidays came last year, so I spent those uh, weeks during the summer holidays building it up. I would, I would say that's a summer holiday well spent. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Well,
Okay, so um, we've decided to do a game from the latter part of the Boxer Uprising. This was after the legation to the Northern Cathedral had been freed of their siege. Right. The um, Allied forces were by this stage under the command, United Command of the Germans, and they had a very simple instruction go out into the countryside in various punitive columns and do as much damage as they could. Break up boxer formations, uh, punish the Chinese. Um, it was so brutal and bloodthirsty that one German soldier wrote home to his mother and said, Mother, I don't know why we're doing this. I'm actually killing women, children and innocent people and burning their homes. So it was quite a brutal campaign by the Western powers yeah. to subjugate the Chinese. Um, but this battle is fictitious, but it combines elements of two other battles. One where um, a Russian gunboat helps drive off a uh, Chinese attack, and another where an Allied column bumped into a mixed force of Chinese and boxers who were defending a city right. and had to be driven off before they could advance. So we've taken two separate elements to create our own Bring them version. Together. Yeah. And also, it's an excuse to make a Russian gunboat. Well, actually, it's a British, <laughs> it's a generalised gunboat, it's a British gunboat, uh, crew with British crew. All the figures, the gunboat, everything on this table, apart from the buildings, is the work and the property of Mike Blake, who wrote yeah. these guides and co wrote with me the Boxer Uprising guide and um, is, is the overall guru on this period. So they're probably quite accurate then, oh, right? Oh, very, yeah, very yeah. accurate. Are there particular brands or are a lot of conversions? A lot, a lot of them are conversions, but a lot of them come from a company called Armies in Plastic. Okay. Um, who produce some basic figures. And then what Mike has done over the last 20, 30 years is paint them, convert them to create the forces that he wants. So on the table, we've got forces that represent um, British Naval Brigade, British Royal Marine Light Infantry, German Sailors, German East Africa Brigade, German Sea Battalion, Russian Sailors, French Zouaves and French Chasseurs d'Afrique on one side and the other side has got boxers, it's got Imperial Chinese troops in their old style costumes and weapons and then Imperial Chinese troops with more modern weapons. So we've had six players, three per side, but each one has had a unique force. Yes. It's, it's an odd one for me that this isn't a more popular thing to play because there are so many different nations involved, yes. so many different weapon types and the, different uniforms and colours. Well, the interesting thing is that on the western side, <coughs> there were eight allied nations. So there were Austro-Hungarians, British, Germans, Americans, Italians, French, Russians, Germans and Japanese. Yeah. On the other side, the Chinese are such a mixture. You've got some of them in the more modern Imperial Army uniforms, which are blue or bright red. And then you've got traditional armies, which have got more like you would imagine a Chinese force was. And then you've got the boxers, which are totally different. Yeah. And, and within the boxers, we've got um, a unit called the Red Lanterns. Yeah, they're the ladies, aren't they? They were. The Tiger Men were fairly unique because not only did they wear clothes that were reflected the tiger they carry grappling hooks yeah to take down cavalry, to take right. cavalry. yeah yeah um, and some of their shields had fist pistols fitted inside them for close close quarter work so the Chinese forces are really interesting to use and you've got to use them very carefully because some of them have got no firearms so you've got that traditional colonial spears and swords yeah. against rifles and yet some of them are better as well armed as the Europeans. Yeah, maybe just not quite as well drilled or anything. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, have you had uh, good feedback? Is it, I guess the figures no. and the terrain are drawing Lo people in. Loads of people come and take photographs. Loads of people have been asking questions. Um, a lot of people have picked up the books and looked at them. Um, yeah, it's, it's had a really, really good, uh, good impact. And the fact that we're right by the main door and people that have been that probably coming helps. And, and talking, yeah. 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 I'm amazed you've got any gaming done at all, really. No, we have. Um, and. The rules allow such flexibility that you... It's been a seesaw, backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Yeah. Game, design play, or whether you're producing educational games, or be it for young people, or be it in the military, you have to work out what is the message I'm going to get across here. What choices do I want people to make?
Rodriguez, you're out the back for the first round. That's the green one. Right. Okay, where uh, can I spot them coming? Uh, yeah, really. So, what I'm going to do is, he's, he's in the bocage. Yep. And... Throwing it around the head. Yeah. And my more team behind this one. Target your infantry in the... In the show hall. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we'll have a six. <laughs> First guy's in the game, yeah, cool. Med medium, uh, two inch. Uh, well, we'd probably be in that building now because we want to target one of these two, don't we? I'm here with uh, Ben from Bunny Badger Games and you've brought another somewhat eclectic mix of gaming fun here. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about what's going on? Yeah, you've got a, um, an exploration of British culture via the medium of classic children's television. Which is generally so, terrifying. Yeah, um, hence the fact we've got Nosey Bonk on I one did of the notice him up there. So, there's how many, you've got your different hexagons, are they, of action? Yep. And each represents a different kind of TV show. A different TV show, a different board, a different set of adventures for the characters to sort their way through. And players start off in Teletubbies. Yes. And then, is it different rule sets for different parts, or is it all... For some of the same? games, yes. You've got some of the games are, are fighting ones, so Teletubbies, Grainshaw, Blue Peter. Then we've got Pugwash. Yeah. Uh, which is basically our excuse for trying to get middle-aged war gamers to play um, push-up pirate. Yeah, yeah. Pop-up pop pop pirate. Pop-up pirate, yeah. Um, and then we've got Games Workshop land here. Games Workshop, Dungeons and Dragons. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, again, that's another fighting one. Yeah. The Doctor Who one is avoiding the Tory Daleks. Right, yeah. Uh, they have a prescribed movement, which the players have to try and figure out, dodge them and get to the target. Okay, so that's like pattern recognition and stuff. Absolutely. Then we've got um, the Scooby... Corridor, which is the BBC Complaints Department, okay. uh, which is random in and out of doors with a ghost chasing you, avoid the ghost at all costs, or take a wound. Right. The adventure game, which is the Vortex game, you've got to get from A to B without the Vortex getting you. We do have a second board over there, which the players can't see, which the Vortex is on. And then you finish off in Postman Pat, which, which is another combat. Right? Which you've bastardised somewhat with an Ed 209 uh, and Scooby-Doo. Uh, Pat, Pat 209. Oh, I apologise, I apologise. The, the Fujitsu, the Fujitsu Postbot 209. <laughs> and instead of a black and white cat, it's got a black and white tiger tank. I like it, I like it. Okay, so how, how have people been doing generally? Have they been making it through or are they getting... Uh... Most games we've had one or two survivors. Okay. Um, so people have been winning, but not a lot. There have been a lot of people dying en route. And have you found there's been a favourite kind of area for people? Uh, we've been letting people choose which way they want to go up, and we get a fairly good response all the way. The, the moment so far is when we did the pop-up pirate board and Pretty Patel got launched into the air. <laughs> that got a big cheer. Okay, yeah, yeah. You always yeah. like to touch a little on the politics side of things. Pretty much. Yeah. But we like to have a poke at everyone, so... It was, it's an interesting kind of way you've displayed it. How did you come up with the idea for the graduating kind of hexes going up? We wanted to do a, um, excuse me, we wanted to do a dungeon crawl. And the idea was to have different spheres moving from room to room. And we just thought this would be a nice way to present it. It was just one of those conversations, well, how should we do it? Well, let's make it escalating. Yeah. How can we make it escalating? Oh, hexes work. And then it was just... Came, to, came together. Yeah. There's quite a lot of unique looking figures. Are there conversions or are these all just from different companies? I think there's some Crooked Dice that I've seen in there. Yeah, we've got a whole bunch. Um, Carl from Crooked Dice has been amazing. He's given us lots of stuff. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff from Tag, the Assault Group. Right, uh, yeah. Fenris Games has given us some bits and pieces. Ainsty, um, Little Soldier Company gave us the politi Politicos for the Top right, of the Daleks. Yeah. Um, Mine Lives Games did us some great 3D printing. So the D&D figures the mystery van, the Pat One van. Yeah. Um, and then there's just a lot of conversion work as well. The Pugwash boats, the yeah. Fenris boats, and then 3D, well, not 3D printed, um, 2D printed characters. Uh, no, that's really so, cool. Yeah, so a lot of conversion work, a lot of stupid having fun. Okay. So 
Retired war gamers reloaded. Hi, James. Hello, and you've got a bit of a, it's a battle for Pegasus Bridge game that you're it doing. It is. Here. It's um, 
the action for the daytime at Pegasus Bridge. So everyone does the, you know, ham and jam, capturing the bridge stuff. Yeah. This is the German counter-attack during the day. Right. So, yeah, it's quite an impressive looking board. You've got some lovely details going on. Uh, I guess the first thing, tell us about how you made it, what's what's the terrain from and stuff like that. Uh, I 3D printed all the buildings. Yeah. So there's a couple of manufacturers of STLs um, that I've used their... their um, files for the tram station that's not available commercially that was done specifically just for me oh cool um but obviously things like Benneville Chateau yeah all the buildings around Pegasus Bridge you always see Cafe Gondre you never see the rest of them yeah so that's all the right buildings around Pegasus Bridge Cafe Pico which has now gone so is this from you just seeing the files online or have you actually gone in and I've studied been, I've, what should I've been be in. I yeah. was, um D-Day last year I was actually at Pegasus Bridge right so, okay um you should try and do a research trip before we do a set so um yeah. Yeah. And so it, it like, looks pretty impressive. I mean, you've got the scale kind of orchards and things as well yeah. look really nice. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's compressed in scale. Yeah. We've had to compress yeah. it because, I mean, Pegasus, um, um, Benneville Chateau should really be over by that game table is, but yeah, so yeah. it won't let us build one that big. I don't know why. It's unfair. It's Just very unfair. unfair. Very unreasonable. Um, and yeah, it's very modular by the looks of things. Yeah, it's all built on two footboards, all goes to the back of my car. Yeah. So everything comes off. Uh, built on styrofoam with um, hanging basket liner. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that gives you that extra texture on there. Yeah, and then just bung flock on. It's yeah. And the great thing about it is, even if the flock comes off, you've still got that kind of worn kind of look. Yeah, the texture. Underneath. And then the pathways are just yeah, carved the in road, afterwards. No, yeah, the roads and pathways are just. Um, you know the stuff you put on stairs like grip. Oh yes, yeah. Yeah, they're that just dry brush. Okay, cool. Because it's already sticking, so just. Yeah. Yeah, it looks really impressive, and I. I think the, the contrast between the different areas of terrain works really well. Is that yeah. something that's just like a blessing of the geography yeah, it of is, this it area? Is. And really. also, because of where it is, because it's a river basin, it just happens to be flat. Yeah. So I didn't have, we didn't have to carve any hills this yes. time. So that <laughs> was quite a blessing. But you've got a bit of verticality from there. Oh, you've always got to have verticality, yeah. So they've got, they've got the, the church at Lepore. Yeah. Um, uh, Benneville Mary down there. Yeah. And then Ranville over there. No, so, it really is nice. And then in terms of the figures that you're using in the game system you're yep. playing? Uh, so we're playing Rapid Fire Reloaded. Yeah. Uh, figures are mainly, uh, well, there's three, really. There's um, uh, Flames of War, um, there's uh, Plastic Soldier, and some Peter Pig. Okay, yeah. And then so, you've got some 3D printed stuff here as yeah, well. Yeah, all these the, parachutes and things are 3D yeah. printed. Um, most of the stuff, even things like the... Telegraph poles are 3D printed. The vehicles are not; they're um, yeah. they're metal. But, um, and then just scale kits for all the aircraft. No, they're, they're 3D printed. Oh really? Oh okay. So you've yeah. really embraced the 3D printing. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I've just bought a new one. Right. Um, I bought uh, um, an Ender 3 V3, which is you know a new printer, 200 quid. I mean. Yeah. It's you know silly not to yeah I mean when did you sort of come across to 3D printing was I started it recently? four years ago okay so I don't know if you remember last year we had that big Caron Tan set yes yeah um, so one of the reasons I wanted to do this is to show gamers what you can do with 3D printing you yeah. know I mean these are just buildings I mean there's the whole resin vehicles figures kind of thing as well you can do yeah I haven't even started on that yet yeah so, um, I mean you've got obviously slightly more traditional methods for all the trees and things yeah. there well though. we made them with Woodland Scenic stuff yeah. So, because um, that means you have the variety, like the trees along the edge of the canal and the woodland trees. Um, the orchard trees are um, all from China. Oh, yeah. You know, good old eBay. Yeah, yeah. The one of my friends pointed out, if this is meant to be June, they shouldn't have apples on them. <laughs> so I thought it was... I thought it was a bit picky, to be honest. Uh, maybe a little, maybe yeah. a little. But you need people like that to just keep oh, you yeah, honest, you right? Yeah, you do. Yeah, an intentional anachronism to yeah uh, are there any other kind of key points of interest that yeah. where you've put in little details there's a new detail that's Major Schmidt who was the commander of Ronville okay he got captured fairly early on and was very pissed off about it right so he's standing there in the middle with his arms folded <laughs> is he almost like an objective for this mission no now, he's just like so. a sort of a, a vignette you know and in the um, gun pits over there and I've also added the machine guns and, the, and dead bodies because they were the guns, or one of them, the gun, machine gun, and took out Den Brotheridge as he ran across the bridge. Um, he was mortally wounded on the bridge and died outside Cafe Gondre. There's actually a dead figure outside Cafe Gondre now, just to right. kind of represent a little him, tribute. <laughs> a little tribute to Den Brotheridge. So, um, and we've got the, the boats coming up the canal. 
Um, got Wally Parr manning his uh, 50 mil anti-tank gun. And we've got the right vehicle knocked out by Wagger Thornton with his pit. Oh yeah, so, with the vibrant flames yeah. coming out. Yeah. Well, it burned throughout the night, so um, obviously he made a hell of a bang with it. Yeah, yeah, I imagine so. So, um, yeah, um, that's, that, that is a 1 100th one kit though. Yeah. Right, and then the rest are The rest printed. are 3 printed. Oh, yeah. Is there anyone you want to kind of give a shout out to, other people who've helped out with the board no, or anything just, like I, that? No, it's all me. It's all you. <laughs> well, then, congratulations, because it looks really good. Um, well, Larry, my friend Larry did help. Yeah. But, um, he did the hedges and other bits and pieces, but yeah, this is mainly all me. No, excellent stuff. I really like this landing area and stuff, because you've yeah. even got the supply drops. Yeah, I wanted to portray that yeah. you know, it is a drop zone. So um, I wanted to kind of get that across with a. I mean, these are just. 3D printed. Yeah, you can just see the lines on, but yeah. only when you get really close, yeah. right? So they work. They work. They work really well. Yeah. So. This video has been brought to you by WI Prime War Games Illustrated Magazine's online members club. View more videos or find out more about WI Prime by following these links.